All right. In order to ensure that everyone can clearly hear the presenters and hopefully avoid any technical difficulties, I'll be muting everyone but our presenters once we get started here. But I'll ask um, you to please mute yourself using either star pound or selecting the mute feature on your phone, on your desk phone or your mobile device, whichever you're calling in on. We ask that you please share your questions and comments in the Q&A pod, which you'll find in the lower left-hand corner of the next presentation window here. So please type those in, and we'll be sure to help the presenters field those and address those. Um, again, we'll be sharing the recording and the transcript and all the presentation materials that you'll see today. Um, you'll be able to download them at the end of the webinar, again, in the lower left-hand corner. Um, in the last window that I'll bring up, it'll have the evaluation in it. Uh, but again, I'll be sure to send that out to the group um, as attachments um, along with the rest of the material um, after the webinar is concluded. And I'll hand it over to David real quick to make sure there's nothing he wants to share and to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think when the Employment First team uh, met about 10 months ago and was planning out our community practice topics, we thought this might be a timely topic on transition, but little did we know how uh, much priority this was getting. I think through the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act, there are a number of uh, initiatives that are pushing how do we change the labor market participation rate and employment outcomes for people with disabilities. And it evolves around what we do with transition and school-to-work initiatives. So uh, in, in speaking about state fair terms, this transition topic is really the cute baby in the stroller that's getting all the attention at the state fair right now. And we're fortunate to have some subject matter experts with us to share some of the things that are going on in the state uh, that's impacting transition. Uh, we have Mary from the Vocational Rehabilitation Office and, and Becky and Erica from our Emmitsburg School System. Uh, Becky and Erica will share a little bit about their involvement with the school district and their METS project, and Mary will share a little bit about transition initiatives going on with the, the State Voc Rehab Office. So um, thank you, uh, and we'll turn it over to Mary to get us going. Thanks, David. Um, like David said, I'm Mary Jackson. I am the resource manager with Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services, and I specialize in transition. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I have been with IVRS for about 11 years. I started out as a VR counselor, actually, in our Waterloo office, and then moved into program planner and am now resource manager. So just to get started, um, I was asked to talk with you today about VR's transition initiatives and partnering with schools. WIOA, also known as the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that Dave just alluded to, ties into everything we are doing right now. So during today's presentation, I'll be giving a brief overview on how WIOA aligns with IDEA, along with some definitions from the legislation and how this is being implemented at the local level. I will also be discussing some of our programs that provide services to our transition students across the state as well as strategies that IVRS is utilizing when serving students in transition. So to get started, how does WIOA align with IDEA? The Department of Education is currently sifting through the legislation and will be providing additional information on this, but the provisions related to IVRS's work in the schools say that we need to create a continuum of services that aligns with IDEA but does not supplant the legal responsibility of the schools. WIOA also says that the schools and IVRS need to jointly develop a system so students achieve competitive integrated employment. That is obviously our main goal. So to develop this continuum, it's helpful to understand some of the new terms that have come out of the new legislation. Student with disability, the first one on here, is obviously not a new term, but it has been defined within WIOA. And so just reading through this on the slide, the student with a disability is an individual with a disability in school who is not younger than 14 years of age and is not older than 21 years of age. If the state allows for a higher age, that's taken into account, but in Iowa it is 21, is eligible for and receiving special education or related services under Part B of IDEA 
or is an individual with a disability for purposes of Section 504. Another new term that's come from the legislation is potentially eligible, and that's referring to any student with a disability, regardless of whether the student has applied for or been determined eligible for IVR services. Another term that is new from the legislation is pre-employment transition services. Pre-employment transition services are collaborative services that are designed to provide exposure to various career options to students with disabilities in the early stages of the transition process. These services can be provided to any student with a disability, including the potentially eligible, which I just mentioned. In the past, VR was only able to work with students who had applied and been found eligible, but now we're able to provide these pre-employment transition services to students with disabilities prior to applying for VR. So you can see how that can be advantageous to us in the school districts where before um, it stopped us sometimes with working with some students because they hadn't applied for services or maybe in intensive needs hadn't been identified for those students. But through these pre-employment transition services, we can reach more students in the school district. So listed here are the five required activities, and those include the job exploration counseling, work-based learning experiences, counseling on opportunities, workplace readiness training, and self-advocacy instruction. So I'm just going to kind of go through each of these just to kind of give you an idea of what each of these services entails. So job exploration counseling includes any counseling to assist the student with a disability to learn and understand the demands of the workforce, the types of jobs available, and the skill requirements needed to perform the essential functions of that job and job exploration experiences as well, so that the student with a disability can make an informed choice regarding their vocational goal. Examples of job exploration counseling could include administration of vocational assessment, inventories, and also discussion on career pathways for the interest areas that maybe were identified from those assessments that were completed. Work-based learning experiences. This includes in-school or after-school opportunities or experiences that are outside the traditional school setting that are provided in an integrated environment to the maximum extent possible. I'll be talking about an example of this later on with one of the programs making the grade that we have. But examples of work-based learning experiences include job shadowing, worksite tours, and internships. Counseling on opportunities. This is referring to counseling on how to enroll in comprehensive transition or post-secondary educational programs at institutions of higher education. So examples of this could include a discussion on disability support services or maybe applying for college and the admissions process that the student would go through. Workplace readiness training is referring to activities that are designed to develop the social skills and the independent living skills of the student in order to demonstrate the work ethic and the attitudes and behaviors that the student would need in order to be successfully employed in a competitive integrated environment. So examples of this could possibly be training in financial literacy, um, training in job seeking skills, as well as other soft skills training that would be necessary for employment. Self-advocacy instruction. This involves training, instruction, and counseling on self-advocacy skill development. Examples of this types of trainings would be activities in which students learn about their rights, responsibilities, and how to request things such as like accommodations. If a student was maybe going on to post-secondary education at the college level, this would, a type of training would be on how a student would request those accommodations in that setting. Nothing in the legislation allows VR to supplant the legal requirements of the school as outlined in IDEA. So collaboration with school districts, AEAs, community partners is all essential for implementation of pre-employment transition services. These services will look different in each school, and it's up to that local team to make these decisions on how to implement this. I think you can see throughout the description of each of the services that I just gave on the previous slide how important it is for VR and school districts to collaborate with partners such as the CRPs, workforce development, businesses, families. We want to make sure that these discussions surrounding pre-employment transition services are including all of the team members. 
And on this slide, you can see some examples. And these are just some examples that have been happening across the state on some um, teams implementing pets or the pre-employment transition services. So the first example is just in classes where individuals with disabilities attend and they gain the knowledge and understanding, but there's no specialized support that's individualized. Some VR staff were going in and providing expertise and information on the ADA, accommodations, advocacy, et cetera, so that they could gain access and are successful in those programs. Other times, IBRS staff may work with teachers and partners during their planning times to discuss pre-employment transition services, and then the content is infused into the classes that they're presenting to students. By assisting with and arranging internships, work experiences, employer panels, we've had career fairs and job fairs and reverse job fairs set up, and students gain that real-world understanding of work and work requirements. So on this slide, this is just another slide to, again, accentuate the collaboration piece as being key. And this slide is just to show how information can be pulled, both from WIOA and the IDEA, and how it correlates in each of these areas. I already gave a description of each of these five pre-employment transition service activities, but this just shows how things relate to IDEA, and they can fall under each of these different categories. Um, for example, under the work-based learning experiences for WIOA, for IDEA, a lot of the school systems have work experience programs, generally that are unpaid, but they have those experiences that are hopefully moving into that paid environment. But you can see how those both correlate, and we could collaborate to work together on that. And we can also tie in our community partners to make those experiences what the students need in order to reach successful employment post high school. And last fall, some of you may be aware of this, IDRS and the Department of Education developed a memorandum of agreement regarding the rules and responsibilities between IVRS, LEAs, which is the local education agency, also just known as the school district, and the Department of Ed. And if anyone is interested in learning more about this, the presentation and materials can be found on the VR website, and it's also on the website for the Department of Ed. We've done presentations on that, so I'm not going to touch on that today, but I just wanted to let you guys know that that present, presentation material is available if you're interested. So just moving into some of the programs that we have available for serving our transition students. Just to start, we have the Transition Alliance Program, also known as TAP. And it's a program that is a result of a collaboration between local community school districts and VR. TAP is designed to assist students with disabilities with their transition from school to adult life. TAP has been around for a while, so this may or may not be new to some people on here. Um, but through participation in TAP, students gain the skills necessary to be college and career ready. Students can begin participating in TAP during their freshman year in high school and can continue in the program until they reach the age of 25. Um, like I said, TAP has been around for a while, but we are actually planning to expand this program to hopefully include about three additional districts during this upcoming school year. And we're also looking at possibly expanding um, as well during the following school year. So just to give you an idea on the size of the program, during federal fiscal year 15, TAP served 1,377 individuals. And there's a whole line of individuals all the way from in high school until the age of 25. So obviously that extends out and it, and it creates that bridge from being in high school um, to transitioning to that adult life. So it, it, obviously these are all great programs, but TAP has been around for a while, so we've been able to show the success through TAP um, over the years. But for more information on the districts that currently have TAP, I would definitely encourage you to go to our website. And if you click on Partners on our website, um, there is a link that will take you to the Transition Alliance program and provide you with additional details. The next program is Making the Grade. And it's one of our newer transition programs. It's actually a new contract that just started May 1st. Making the Grade is an employment program designed to provide students in high school the opportunity to obtain part-time employment after high school and during the summer. One of the predictors of success for students following high school is having a paid work experience while in high school. So this program was actually designed with that philosophy in mind. So 
So the focus of this program is on the development of the work skills and job readiness competencies for students with disabilities while in high school. This program provides the pre-employment transition services that I talked about, um, the work-based learning. This one really focuses on that in order for the students to gain those skills that they're going to need for their future career. A student can participate in making the grade all throughout high school until they reach graduation. And making the grade is a collaboration between CRPs, school districts, and BR. And for more information on this program and which districts currently have a making the grade, I would encourage you to contact your local VR office. The next program on here is the Youth Leadership Forum, YLF. This is another program that has been around for a while. And YLF is a collaboration between Iowa Department of Human Rights, Iowa Department for the Blind, and VR. And this is currently a week-long program, and it was developed to provide leadership training to junior and seniors in high school. The program focuses on developing self-advocacy skills through encouraging and empowering students to reach their goals. Students who attend YLF, they become knowledgeable on resources that are available, and it also assists with becoming successful adults by exposing them to professionals with disabilities who are recognized leaders and role models in the community. Towards the end of the forum, they're actually um, welcoming these individuals to participate and meet the students face to face and have a luncheon together so they can network and make those connections and hear about their stories. So there's currently about 40 students per year that attend YLF. So if you have a student who is interested in learning more about this program, I would definitely encourage you to um, tell them to go to the website for the Iowa Department of Human Rights or to contact their VR counselor to talk about their interest in it so they can apply to attend for next year's forum. Project Search. I think many of you on here are familiar with Project Search. We currently collaborate with Des Moines Public Schools and Easter Seals for our Project Search high school students that are attending Des Moines Public Schools. I just wanted to mention that we have another Project Search, search that's going to be starting in Waterloo, and it will be available for students that attend school in that district. The new Project Search, it's a collaboration between the Waterloo School District, Inclusion Connection, IVRS, and some other community partners in that area. Like I said, I think you guys are familiar with Project Search on here, so I'm not going to go too much into depth. I just wanted to let you guys know that we have another collaboration happening with a local school district in that that will be open to only the high school students within that district. The last one on here that I have, this is our newest project called Intermediary Networks. It is in the very beginning stages, so I just have a brief information about it, but I just wanted to mention it today. And this is going to be a collaboration between VR and the Department of Ed that will specifically target service delivery for secondary students with disabilities who are receiving services under an IEP or a 504 plan prior to graduation. So it's anticipated that these intermediary networks will expand our work-based learning opportunities for students with disabilities. And it's going to target school districts across the state. And these intermediary networks will work extensively with local business and industry to provide these opportunities. There is going to be more information to come on this in the future. But like I said, I just wanted to mention it today since we're talking about VR's work with transition students. And you guys might be hearing more about this in the near future. So strategies. I don't know if you guys counted, um, but I can't even count how many times I use the word collaboration throughout this presentation. Collaboration, I cannot stress this enough. It's, it's the key, I think, to working with transition students, and it's something that we're emphasizing across VR. Um, collaboration across, occurs across multiple partners for all of the programs I talked about today, and obviously with VR services and implementing our pre-employment transition services and the philosophy behind WIOA, it's all about collaboration. So for VR, that's a strategy that we have used in the past for several years, actually, but now it's just reinforced with that legislation and with all of the new programs that are out there. They cannot happen without that collaboration occurring. Parent engagement. I wanted to mention that as a strategy that we're stressing with, within our system as well. When I talked about teams throughout this presentation, I'm including parents as an essential part of these teams when we're working with the students. 
However, I think sometimes people leave parents out when they're holding meetings or planning and um, implementation of the pre-employment transition services or different initiatives across the state with various agencies. Parents and families are definitely an essential part of our team. So we want to make sure that when we come together that we're including parents and families in those discussions. VR right now is collaborating with various parent engagement groups, actually, in how we're messaging out WIOA. We're going to collaborate on some documents that are going to be released and also on some upcoming webinars that are directed just towards parents to answer some of their questions um, and how it relates to their child in the transition process. So I can't stress that enough either. And also another, and there's more strategies than this, but I know my time was time limited here, so I'm trying to get through this. Sometimes I can talk a lot and fast when I get excited about transition. So I'm just going to mention the use of technology. I think it's no surprise to anyone on here that our youth are currently in a technology age. They learn by technology. So we need to make sure that we're using technology not only to engage our students and services, but also when we're holding meetings for families and partners. Um, We've talked extensively with CRPs when we've gone out and talked with other partners as well in school districts and our own staff to make sure if a meeting is held to give that option to come in virtually for the meeting. It doesn't necessarily have to be an in-person meeting. We could FaceTime, Skype, um, via teleconference if we needed to, just like we are today to get the information out there and that everybody can be a part of the meeting then. I just wanted to thank everyone for letting me talk today. I, I really haven't been paying attention to questions, if any had popped up. So I don't know if I need to turn it back over to Jeff to let me know if there were any questions at this point. Thank you, Mary. No, it doesn't look like any have come in at this time. Um, if folks think of any specifically for Mary, um, as the presentation continues, please just be sure to type them in um, and we'll get those answered. Um, and Mary, we'll make sure to share those with you. I think we'll okay. go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I think we'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation here with Becky and Erica. I'm going to get that pulled up for them. And again, Becky and Erica are joining us from Emmitsburg School, um, and they've been working really hard in their METS project and just in general in implementing different transition strategies. So we're really excited to have them here today as well um, and to share with us what they've been doing and what's working for them. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Becky and Erica. That's just fine. Can you guys hear us? Yes, yes, I think so. You guys let us know if you can't hear them very well, and we'll let them know. But so far, so good, ladies. We are a Google school, so we started this presentation on Google Slides. So if some of them don't look great, notes-wise or anything like that, just let us know, and we can send you guys a copy of it at the end. Um, but as stated earlier, we were a uh, MET school, and we were one of five sites that were selected for this grant. And we've taken it and run with it. And so this presentation will be a little bit of an overview of what MESS was for us, uh, what it currently is, and then what we're going to do moving forward, and how we collaborated with the different agencies throughout and during the process. A little bit about our school to start off with. Um, we have at the middle school, we are a small, very rural school. And we, um, but in that aspect, we don't have very many uh, different agencies and businesses around the area. So we've really had to think outside of the box of different options that we have. Um, yeah. Okay. So when we started the program, these were some of the goals of it. We wanted to make sure that we had quality vocational rehabilitation referrals who can obtain and be successful on the job. We wanted to increase 
career development resources in the middle school and high school to provide opportunities for each student to obtain paid employment. We had a flow of services to meet the needs of all students. We wanted to make sure that that was developed and updated as we continued. And we had continued development of relationships with businesses in the community. Mathis is committed to furthering staff training to assist students. There's paid work experience for students before graduation. And um, we wanted to make sure that we enhanced our career planning resources and managed employment services. We provided career and job exposure as well. Those are the things that we really wanted to commit to with this grant. So these are some of the different partners and agencies that we worked with throughout it because what we noticed is when we started, we started very small, but as the years went on, we just kept on adding and adding and building to our services because more heads are sometimes better than one to work together. And just as Mary noted, collaboration is key and it was a huge thing for us. So these are some of the different partners that we had. Um, and we actually, in the course of these five years, we started with nine people collaborating around the table, and now we have over 20 members, which is awesome, from different communities, um, our Emmitsburg um, Community School District, the businesses. We have an awesome intermediary um, through Iowa Lakes Connect, which we're going to talk about a bunch later on. She's been instrumental in this process. Our AEA, our workforce development person, Val Bonney, um, our CPCs and our awesome vocational rehab counselor. OK, so we're going to kind of talk about some different things we've done and that we've been successful with. Um, the first being our family engagement night. So what it is is um, this will be our fourth year doing it in the fall of parent-teacher conferences. We realized prior to this we had um, IEP meetings and members from these different agencies would come and parents would not know why they're there, um, and they would be very turned off by it. So we figured this would be a great way for parents to meet our agencies um, in a very non-threatening way. So what we do is during parent-teacher conferences, we schedule them to come to family engagement nights. So the same night they have parent-teacher conferences, they come to the library. And so they're meeting with different agencies represented, um, our vocational rehabilitation counselor, our workforce development coordinator, uh, our transition consultant through AEA. We also have um, a SAVE program, which is our 4 plus 1 program. She meets with students as well. And then our Horizons Unlimited, which our CPC person. So they get to meet with them individually and get to know them. So when it would come to IEP meetings, they would say, oh, yeah, I remember you. Or there wouldn't be that disconnect when we were meeting um, earlier. So this has been hugely successful with our families and with our agencies. They can't say enough good things about this. Um, and we've actually had some students who have went on their own because their parents couldn't come. But they knew that they needed to attend this because they wanted to know more about the services they could have. Um, with this now being our fourth year doing it, we have talked about changing this to be two nights instead of one and have it more segmented freshman, sophomore, and then junior, senior. And then with the juniors and seniors, start talking about financial aid and how to fill that out. Um, meeting with our disabilities coordinator through Iowa Lakes so she can start to get them filling out paperwork for accommodations and really start talking about life after high school. So that's something that's in the works for our district this year to make some changes for that. Just like with the rest of this, we've noticed we needed to add more people as we went on. We're continuing to add people to our services on the family engagement night. Uh, we found that just having some of those people there has been not only instrumental for our students, but also for their family members. Um, we've had cases where the parents were really excited because they could actually get a job from uh, WIOA services. And then there was also an instance where a parent's kid could also get services, and they did not know that. Um, so just even opportunities that the family engagement I have provided has also um, given us great input back from them and the different agencies within the area. The next one is our um, positive personal profiles, or P3s as we call them. 
Um, this is a document from Transcend, so I'm sure some of you probably have seen it or been familiar with it. And then there's actually um, a sample, one of these filled out that you'll see again towards the end. Um, it's a positive personal profile, so it's all about the students. Um, we realized that within our school, the special ed department was just using this to help kind of drive their IEPs. Um, and we realized three years ago, why don't we have this for all students? It's all positive, and it helps us get to know the students on a more personal level. Um, so we fill these, we pitched it to our staff, which they were excited about, and then so we had them each go through and create their own personal profiles when we were teaching the process to them. And then they, in turn, did it to all of their homerooms. So we do this um, 512. We have students fill out a per positive personal profile, and then they're updated yearly. And then it's been really great because we present these to our parents at conferences. And it's been so awesome seeing the conversation switch to um, from why are you doing so poorly in algebra and you, know, you can't get here on time to I didn't realize that you wanted to be a welder. Um, are you taking classes to be a welder? Um, have you, you know, looking at learning styles? I didn't realize you were a hands-on learner. Why are you sitting in a lecture class? Um, so this has really been instrumental um, within our organization and METS in a whole because our community partners all have access to these positive personal profiles as well. So whenever they set um, people up for job shadows or anything dealing with career, they have all of these. So they know exactly what their likes and dislikes are what their goal is, what different interests they have. Some of the things that we put into this document as well is different inventory surveys, personality assessments, and learning styles. So that way that information was categorized for not only the students, um, but for the parents and also the different service providers that they may or may not be going to. As stated earlier, we made sure that it was extended to the full gen ed and not just special, special ed for all grade levels. Uh, I was brought on in the middle school special education teacher because we found that the earlier the better was a, a general concept that we needed to address. So at our school, the middle school got on board as quickly as possible, and we did the same thing with making sure that the teachers knew how to uh, make the inventories and the different uh, parts of the P3 more applicable to the student's level. And so it made sense to them at the time. Some of them aren't capable of having jobs at this time. So being able to apply it to their classroom setting and how they work within that setting and then thinking beyond was a challenge for some of them. But it, it made it very clear uh, at conferences that the focus was back on the student's path and not just the content area or academic area. Because at the middle school, we have uh, student-led conferences. The students then presented about their P3 themselves to the parents. And some of the conversations that ensued from it, just like Becky had said earlier, were very interesting because the parents thought one thing and then they maybe were saying the other because of this. Uh, it's been a driving document for us. Uh, throughout the rest of this presentation, you'll see some different things that have all started and geared from this document. It's been a driving force for some of the changes that we've been doing. All right, so the next one is our job tours and job shadowing. Like I mentioned earlier, our intermediary, Molly Hamilton, formerly Molly Bates, um, she has been, it's been like kismet since she stepped in when we were really hit the ground running with this two years ago. Um, so through her program, and be, um, we do some job shadows. Filling out the form, we have all of our special ed students fill out and complete a job shadow every year. So they're getting early exposure to um, careers they might be interested in. This is open to general ed and special ed students. Um, we have just been really um, pushing the job shadows just so that they can really get a feel for what they might want to do. Because we were finding that students that we thought and they thought were careers they wanted to be interested in when they got out of, of high school, that was not the career path that they, in fact, liked. Um, students have loved doing job shadows. They're gone for half of the day. They get one-on-one -on -one attention with people in actual professions. Um, we had one student um, who went to a veterinary clinic and actually got to watch an operation. Um, she realized after she fainted during that that veterinary or being a vet tech was not something she was interested in. 
But we were really excited that um, despite that happening, we now know that we need to look at some different career paths because blood and deer plant. Um, we also did a job tour day at the end of the school year where sophomores and juniors and freshmen all signed up using their P3 in their career cluster. Then they signed up for um, a different business in our area, so between Emmitsburg, Spirit Lake, and Spencer, of some different places that they might be interested in. And then they were gone for two, three hours of the day exploring large group what that job might look like. Some of the job shadows have been very instrumental, like Becky said earlier, in the fact that they're telling us what the students maybe aren't capable of doing so they can cross out their list and move forward through the outfit. For the middle school, we also did some job tours. Uh, we did them a little bit differently. We found in our uh, different collaboration settings that extended learners or your tag students and our special education students have a similar uh, mindset in the fact that we really have to push for the proper amount of differentiation, and we need them to think beyond just the school setting. And so we got together as a special education department and a tech department to create job tours for those two groups of students. And we used the P3 and a career cluster survey, just like the high school did, to send them out into different local community areas to do job tours within the within the area, and then we just transported them personally to the different places that they could go. And some of them were very exciting. Some of them, uh, they're, they're excited to move forward more ideas on, on how to ask better questions next time. So, yeah. We also do um, a career panel. So we alternate our job tour year with our career panel. So since we did the job tour last year, we will be doing a career panel um, this year. Um, again, Molly, our intermediary, she finds the businesses based on our students' career cluster and our P3, and then they select which career cluster they're the most interested in. And then Molly finds businesses um, and employees from throughout the area to come and speak to our students. There is some questions that are scripted that the students can ask, and then it's basically a two-hour forum of they can ask them anything they want. Um, it was also really interesting. Um, how diverse some of the career clusters are, and students are realizing that the assumption of how much maybe a construction job made or an HVAC job, um, it was in fact not the correct assumption. And that these people want, they're looking for em employees, they're looking for people to train, um, and I think it was very eye-opening for a lot of our students. The um, real side of what this job looks like, um, what education they need, what salary someone in their position could be making, um, and just the, the actual outlook on that job altogether. I think also seeing within each one of those career clusters that there are several different types of jobs mm -hmm. that if you are working in construction, there's still also somebody who's the business side of it, that there's still also somebody that needs to be in charge of other areas. and seeing that just their one viewpoint isn't necessarily the only thing that makes up that career cluster was eye-opening for some of them. At the middle school, we have now changed it. So we have a career fair every day. This is similar to the career panel. Uh, what we do is we also take the P3 and career cluster and survey the students as to which job they would like to know more about. And they have the option of even filling in their own if we didn't provide an option for them. We then, as a counseling department, special education department, and administration, uh, call different people to come in to match the jobs that were selected from the students. So it's very choice driven and interest driven from the students specifically. They then come in and they present to the students. And the students rotate around and they get to see four different uh, career fair presenters, and they can ask questions, and the presenters are told in a general format some of the things they should talk about, things like salary, expectations, uh, job education, the education required to get that job, 
how they work with others, if it's an indoor or outdoor position. So that way they can see how it relates back to the P3 and things to think about moving forward. All right, along with all of those things, then we have, of course, some work experiences. We have really, we have been very blessed to have some really awesome people to work with, with our um, vocational rehabilitation counselor, our workforce development, and our CPCs. We had, um, two summers ago, we had two students that worked with VR and then Horizons um, doing some summer jobs. Um, this picture in the corner was one of our students who she worked out at the Lost Island Nature Center. She has been, um, this fall, last fall she did, she worked at Head Start, and now she um, is gainfully employed, now having some skills and having those experiences working um, with our VR counselor and our CPC. Um, we also had a student complete an internship through, um, we worked with our intermediary at Case IH. He um, had said from the beginning, I want to be a diesel mechanic and I want to work at Case IH, and we said, okay. We set him up on a job shadow and it went swimmingly. It was awesome. He had really high remarks to say for our student. And then when we were talking about a possibility of doing an internship over the summer, um, he jumped at the chance to be part of this, and the um, employer at Case IH said, awesome, we would love to have him. Um, and that was just an awesome experience for this student, um, and he is now going to be going to college and pursuing that um, post-secondary. Um, we also, through our workforce development in Balboni, we have had students employed in different businesses throughout um, Emmitsburg, and um, they have been not only finding the confidence in themselves, but have really come around and been gainful employees there as well. We also, for the last three years, um, have been doing the NCRC testing. It is through ACT, um, or, and it's the National Career Readiness Certificate. And it is a different kind of test because um, it looks at your reading and your math as well as your locating information, but it's more based on your job skills and employability skills and how those three areas relate to your job. Um, so when we first did it, we had sophomores through seniors do it, and we had 33% of our special ed students obtain a certificate. Certificates are platinum, gold, silver, or bronze. Um, and a lot of businesses we are seeing are starting to ask for this certificate because it shows that they possess different skills um, needed, and they know that if they can obtain a bronze or a silver or a goal that they will be able to handle the different tasks needed in these jobs. So the first year we did it, we had 33% of our special ed population um, obtain certificates. In 2015, we, had, we only did it for sophomores and juniors, and we had 62% um, obtain certificates. And then last year, again, only testing sophomores and juniors, we had 65% of our students get a certificate. Um, it's been really awesome to see that even our um, level three students, how excited they get when they get a certificate. Um, we always knew that they had it in them to do it, but it was so great to see that they really tried on this um, and they were able to get a certificate. And some of them, because of this, are now gainfully employed in um, Emmitsburg community. This had all come about because of our workforce development coordinator. She had recommended it to our group and we took hold and like Becky said the first year we did it to everyone mm -hmm. we realized afterwards to scale it back to just the sophomores and juniors because we can do other activities that would be more beneficial for the freshmen and seniors and we can continue to see the growth with the sophomores and juniors they also allowed the option for the seniors to retake it if they wanted to um, but this way it was not necessarily something they had to do they could take the scores that they previously had mm -hmm. And it is a free test, so we were all about that because yeah. it was free. Um, last summer, we also did what we called ESEC. Um, we had six students take part in the Employment Connection, Emmitsburg Summer Employment Connection Program, which was basically like a career boot camp for two weeks. They met in the mornings, and they worked on career like things. They learned how to write a resume and a cover letter. They all went on job shadows. They did three different job tours, and then at the end, um, after having some practice about um, 
and, inter and interviewing skills, they did mock interviews. Again, um, one of our special ed teachers, Shalina, she worked with Molly Hamilton, our intermediary, and they together built this program, and then Molly helped her with all of the business side of it, setting up for the job tours, the job shadows, and then the mock interview at the end. Um, it's been really awesome seeing their, those students' growth within the last year and how far they've come, just even being able to talk to people. She um, said one day with one of the students, she literally had to tell her, you have to get out of the car. You can do this. It'll be OK, and I'll pick you up in two hours. And then just to see that now this person is able to talk to adults on her own and have um, an actual paid job, she's come a, very, a long way. Um, some other things we did last spring, we went to Camp Foster as a special ed department um, with all of our students 9-12. Um, we did a lot of team building, archery, rock or zip lining, rock wall climbing, and it was really awesome to see our students come together and not um, feeling like they um, were stigmatized from the regular, um, their regular peers. They were just able to be themselves and have fun. It was awesome to see how excited and willing to participate and let some of their other talents shine that maybe in the classroom they aren't able to show that. Um, and then Shalene Neg again, she is our level 2-3 special education teacher. She started the Morning Buzz, which is a little coffee program on Fridays. They send out a Google form of who wants coffee or hot chocolate. And then with two of her life skills students, they then would go around and collect the money um, and kind of just work out of our um, family and FCS teacher along with her. Um, it's been really great because she teamed up with some general ed students. So um, we've had a lot of general ed and special ed collaboration. And um, the teachers really enjoyed the coffee shop especially. And I, that's something that she's planning on continuing this fall with some of her students as well. And then the last one, this career readiness boot camp. So this is what, while well, we were taking the NCRC test, the sophomores and juniors, because it was four days, um, our intermediary, she set up this career readiness boot camp for our freshmen. So they did a cover letter. They did a resume, which they used their P3s to kind of help with some of that. Um, and then they ended up, at the end of the week, having mock interviews. Um, they each got to um, interview with three different people and um, then got a rubric back kind of based on how they did or what areas to work on, you know, but the students were preparing all week for, kind of, for this interview. Um, and then the other thing we did this last year with our juniors was the game of life. Molly again did this um, when our whole junior class came and it was really awesome to see um, we had to do some planning beforehand of if you what would you do after high school, after college? If you would go to college, how much would it cost? Would you go to grad school? And then find an average salary for how much that job would be or you would make. Um, and then they had to have all that information before we went there. And then the students would get a fictitious credit score as well as how much money they might need to owe um, if they had credit card debt. And then they had to play off of that. So the students had to go around to different businesses within um, our community and you know they had to budget how much groceries how much they'd spend for groceries or for a house um, they had to meet with a bank to, if they had student loans they had to meet with a bank to set up a payment plan and it was really great for them to see them working on their soft skills and having to talk with people and then trying to figure out man there is a lot to being an adult and having a job and having to pay for all of this and then while that was all going on, they also had reality checks. You know, um, So maybe they got a speeding ticket, or maybe they got fired from their job, um, different things like that. Their water heater broke. And so then they had to figure out how they were going to deal with that as well. Um, it was great when they were all done having the follow-up with them and talking about what they learned, um, what things they need to now pay more attention to, um, You know, looking at colleges, looking at careers. Um, what that will all look like. There was a case study within the career readiness that I kind of want to talk about. There was a student who typically would stay at home to help out with family, low poverty situation, um, and just a general lack of desire to be at school. 
she would show up uh, late to school or just not show up to school. But when this week happened of the Career Readiness Boot Camp Week, he embraced it full heartedly. He was there every day on time. And in the end, uh, with the mock interviews, a group, we weren't sure necessarily if he'd show up or if the anxiety would get to him and he would stay home. But he was there bright and early that morning. And when he went through and did the mock interview with some of those representatives, this one specifically was a journalist, um, she was asked afterwards who she would take on as a career from all those different students. And she had said him just from his very direct questions, his general interest, and the way he phrased things seemed very articulate and on point. She was very impressed with this student. It's just fun to see how when we take the school, sometimes out of school, and put it more in the work context, how much it means to these students moving forward. So we are huge on making sure that we relate with our community resources. Collaboration and communication have been a huge key point for us moving forward. One of the things that we have really tried to emphasize but has been both a downfall and a highlight for us has been our monthly meetings. During those monthly meetings, we all work on a universal document that talks about the different things that we discussed during the meeting. So um, as the slide shows, there's the student's name, whether or not they're assigned with BR, whether or not they're assigned with workforce development, if they're going to be in the SAFE program or not, and what they received, received on the NCRC testing. We wanted to make sure that their P3s were up to date as well as their employment. So that's why we have both the previous and current employment on there. We found that during the meeting we needed to add a discussion tab too just because things continuously change and we wanted to stay up to date on things we needed to look for at uh, the next meeting or different things that we can maybe look into during that time for each student. We also have tabs um, with graduates. We realized that some of our data looking um, after graduation up to five years is very different. So we've been keeping tabs of past graduates for the last three years, what they're doing, are they still in school, are they working, are they still working, are they still connected with our community partners. Um, we also have a tab about um, dropping students who may have dropped out or moved away. Um, our middle school, we have a tab for them. And then we also added to that um, first slide is just with all the job shadows and job tours, where they have done their job shadows or where are they interested in. Um, our community partners have access to all of this. They have access to our universal documentation. They have access to our P3s. We are very transparent with all of um, the needs and successes of our students. It's been really awesome sitting in these meetings, and we're talking about trying to get some experience for one student and have one community member say, I don't have a resource for this place, and have another community partner say, well, I do. Here's the person, or I will call them for you, and we can work together on this. It's been really awesome for them to being able to share their resources instead of having the same person call the same, or different people call the same business for the same student. Um, so that has really helped, and that will probably be one of the biggest things they would say is that um, blending and the braiding of those resources, sharing together, especially with different funding issues. If there's if one can't fund entirely, we've had some where two different groups have funded so that the student can do their summer employment or do some different things that way. As we said, we like to meet at least once a month. And it's however you can get there. If you can be there in person, if it's a Skype or a phone conference call, whatever works, we go through our different roster of students and hit all of those different areas for each student and have a discussion over it. After the first time, it becomes easy because we know where they're at and it's easier to move on from there. The other thing to bring up with this is that these meetings have provided sources for us to continue to access as we go. So with the universal documentation, we also want to be able to share our IEPs with our VR reps, but also the IPEs from the VR reps. So we're inserting our, uh, the IPEs from you guys into our IEPs mm -hmm. and making sure that they align and they match and it's not just 
one is getting different information from the other. So we can meet with that student if that is the case and figure out which way it's actually going and how to move forward from there. It hasn't been completely the easiest thing. We do have successes and we've had obstacles as we've gone through this. One of the three of the big things we really want to emphasize is transparency with all communication. As Becky said earlier, we just wanted to make sure that our services weren't being duplicated. Especially in our area, we have two different Mollies that are big <laughs> service providers for us, and so they weren't sure which Molly called them and who, who was advocating for the students. So making sure that we had transparency and everybody was on the same page really helped us as a success moving forward. Um, we would say, too, that the all student involvement with the middle school and high school, not just having it be a special ed um, program or just doing these things for just special ed, but allowing the general ed population to take part of all of these things that we're doing has been really awesome. And we're seeing um, successes all around by doing that. Another component to that student involvement piece, we wouldn't be able to do any of this if it wasn't for our administrator. Mm -hmm. A couple of years back, we didn't necessarily have as much administration buy-in as we have in the lab. And the moment the administrator bought in was the moment we saw the huge change and switch for our district. It became not just a pet project, it was fully embraced and the school was on board. Because of that, a whole mindset change happened within our school community and the students were no longer the special ed kids. They were not just our kids, they became everybody's. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge positive and success for us just by making that change to being universal because then everybody accepted it. And again, like we talked about, just the community partners, we embrace them every time they come to our buildings. We're excited to see them and to have conversations. And it's been a huge sounding board for us um, as special education teachers as well, having another person to talk to about um, different students so we can ask their opinions and see what they think. But just being able to use them um, and use their resources and sharing of resources has been instrumental in our success with the METS program. Because we said earlier, collaboration is key. Um, just emphasizing, we only started with seven people as our team, and we're upwards of 19, more like 20 at this point, if not more that we keep adding because we find that there are so many people that are experts in different areas, why would we reinvent the wheel? Bring them in, make sure we're on the same page and collaborate with them so we can all move forward in the right direction. There were some obstacles. Like we said, right away the administrators didn't necessarily buy in and because of that the teachers didn't buy in. Um, even when you have administration buy in, sometimes teachers don't buy in. So going through those obstacles and making sure that you do it in the correct format works, but there, it's still an obstacle that sometimes is approached. Um, another one, obviously, our MES grant um, is no longer a grant. This will be our first school year being not funded. Um, and so for us, we had some conversations about and with our superintendent about how important this program is and what we're doing for our students and how there will be times that we may need to meet for the day or a quarter of the day to just hash out different needs and things for our students. Um, we also have talked about needing to have a job coach within our school district and what that will look like as we are going to get some students with higher needs in the next few years, we need to be prepared for that. Um, we also have looked at other curriculums um, and added some different programs because of the MET um, grant, we have now added some different curriculums and new classes that we offer to all students because of it. The MES funding, a big bulk of what it was for us was funding for our subs for time to collaborate. So an obstacle for us was time. Uh, we needed to be able to collaborate with those outside agencies, with general ed teachers, and even within ourselves as a special education department. Um, also, we need time for that professional development. As we said earlier, we had to teach the teachers how to, how to do the P3s and how to do some different um, the student conferences with them and just general interview conversations with them as to what they want to do moving forward. So making sure that there's time allotted is an obstacle that we had, uh, but we're still working on overcoming. Mm -hmm. Last 
fall, we um, kind of just did a feedback of our community partners just to kind of see what they were thinking in regards to um, where they thought we were at with some different things. And this is just some of the, of the things that they had said about this project um, and how, you know, we always as educators want to make sure that if we're not doing our job or there's something missing, we need to change it. So I think this was just great for us to see that we are on the same page and we feel the same way they do in regards to where we're at with um, our progress we have made. So this is our overall project data. Uh, one of the things that we realized is that we needed to be collecting more quantitative data and a little less, or not necessarily less qualitative, but more quantitative moving forward. And where our baseline was and how we started the project, we had um, noticed that there weren't enough sustaining after, after we had been educating them. So this is where this all came from. And we started with two applicants. And our year last year was at zero. Um, part of that is because we already had our five enrolled. And there, and there are five more prospects coming into this next year. So I know our numbers will continue to go up. Um, but as we went through, it was easier for us to make those connections with our representatives and to make sure that we were hitting them in their best need. Mm -hmm. And obviously, too, with changes to um, VR, that's kind of been different this year, too. But it has been awesome having our vocational rehabilitation counselor more available in the school and meeting and working with our students. Um, but we just thought it was just very interesting looking at um, our applicants as well as the average wage per hour and average hours per week. So just as we have been through this program, how things have fluctuated. Um, but we know that from looking at our data from three years ago even, our students are still employed or they're still going to school, um, and we still have connections with them, which is a more relevant data, and that's what we're hoping to continue to see is them sticking with the career path that they had wanted to do when they were at school here. This is just that general blank form that we had talked about earlier with the P3, um, so you guys can have access to it. There will also be one sent to the end if you want it. That's the end of our presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you so much, Becky and Erica. Um, I think as we wrap up here, um, as the lady said, we'll be sure to send out um, samples of the documents that they talked about. And I wonder here, as I open up the polls and um, give folks a chance to respond here, um, if you guys can maybe address real quickly how you got that buy-in from um, the administrators or from like a district-wide perspective, how did you get that buy-in or, or what's the difference? Is it um, expectation and demand from parents and families? Is it starting to get some of those um, positive outcomes and paid work experience? What, what gets that buy-in at that level? I think the number one thing is making sure that everybody realizes the end goal is success for the students. And when you put that goal in front of them and show that you're working on this path and we're working on this path, wouldn't it make more sense for us to work together on this? And putting in how you're saving the time by that collaboration, that has been a huge motivator for us. And I think, you know, honestly, we have been very privileged. We can't say enough good things about our community partners. We have some rock stars when it comes to people who are awesome at their job and really have best interest at heart when it comes to the kids. But we couldn't have done it without our administrator. He has been a driving force from day one. Um, and I think we as the special education teachers have just been super excited about this. It's definitely not been easy, but I think um, we've just been fortunate to have some things fall into our, our lap, which would be like Molly Hamilton. Um, her position fell into our lap year three, and it has been awesome that um, she's been able to ride this out with us. Because without her, I don't know if we would be as far or as doing as, as many things. Because um, it's been great because all of these people have been able to make those business connections that we don't have the time in our days to do to set all this up for our students. Throughout this project, we've had a lot of turnover, which is very mm -hmm. typical, as we all know, for um, schools and for your agencies. So making sure that you maintain the passion 
with new people and with some of the old, just showing the different things that you've done and how much you're committed to it, sometimes helps bring them in more because they just see your passion associated with it. And I think bringing in the parents, it's, I think it's been more because the students are realizing that it's more about them and their interests, and so they're talking to their parents about it. That family engagement night has been huge because parents are getting involved. I know that it's probably not because we tell them that there's going to be snacks there, but um, we figure that by pairing it up with parent-teacher conferences, they're already coming for that, so then this will give them a good reason to come and talk to our um, community partners. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, thank you so much, and thank you again to Mary uh, for the first portion of our presentation today. Um, I encourage folks to share with us your feedback, and again, want to draw your attention to uh, the PowerPoints and some of the sample documents down below. Um, Mary's is there, Erica and Becky's presentation is there, as well as a sample flow of services that they were able to touch on a little bit. That's a really great document um, to take a look at, though it might look a little different for every community. Um, still a really great tool. And then also a sample of a P3. Um, I'll be sure to, um, oh, Becky, remind me of that. Oh, it's the universal documentation sample that we'll send out um, as well because it's in an Excel sheet and the platform doesn't really allow to share that on here in a useful way. So I'll be sure to attach that as well. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, be sure to send them in and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, we hope to see you back in September. We'll be back on Tuesday, September 20th for fading of job coaching and supports after placement with Iowa's good friend Ellen Condon from Mark Gold and Associates. Uh, we'll be excited to hear from her again. Um, and again, we just want to thank our presenters and thank everybody that joined us again today, and we hope to see you in September. Uh, I'll leave the room open for a while so you guys can continue to download and provide your responses. And have a great rest of the day. See you in September. <laughs>